So Carly, over the previous sections of this course, we've spoken about numerous objects that have been observed by indigenous astronomers for thousands of years. And the viewers at home, you guys might find yourselves wanting to go out and explore some of those objects for yourself. And for the super keen uh, amongst um, yourselves, may even be interested in investing in a telescope. So in this lecture, we'll provide you with some ideas on objects that you might like to look at to kickstart your journey in exploring the night sky. Now, the most abundant objects in our night sky are, of course, stars. So a really great place to start would be to be able to identify some different stars. Now, the easiest star to be able to identify is, of course, the brightest star. Now, the brightest star in our southern sky is a star we call Sirius, but it's not actually just a star. It's actually two stars. It's a binary system. So this system, it's almost twice as bright as the next brightest star, uh, which is Canopus. Uh, and that's really because we have, we're actually looking at two stars that are very close together. Now, it appears so bright because of this, uh, this high luminosity from both of the stars, but also because of its close proximity to, to Earth. Now, Sirius is located in the western constellation of Canis Major. This is also called the Greater Dog constellation. It can be seen in the southern hemisphere between the months of April and November. Now, the next object that we're going to talk about is the Large Magellanic Cloud and the Small Magellanic Clouds, which are two irregular dwarf galaxies that orbit around our Milky Way. Uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud is a galaxy that's about 163,000 light years away from us, while the Small Magellanic Cloud is about 206,000 light years away from us. These galaxies are almost exclusively visible only here in the Southern Hemisphere, um, and that's because they are located very close to the South Celestial Pole. Uh, these galaxies have been observed for thousands of years by Indigenous astronomers here, as well as in places like South America and Africa as well. They appear in both oral traditions as well as petroglyphs and rock art found in Chile. Yeah, wow. Another object that you could be looking for is absolutely one of my favorites, that is the Pallades system. Now, they are often called the Seven Sisters, as we've spoken about in um, other sections of this course and they're a really important object in the night sky not just for indigenous peoples but for peoples all over the world and actually throughout history of time as well now we heard about the story from Kakatha country that talks about the seven sisters song line uh, and how the fact that uh, there are variable stars uh, in proximity to the Pallades cluster and how that, um, that physical attribute of those stars, that variable nature was actually embedded into the Kakatha story um, of the seven sisters. The importance of the Seven Sisters is actually something that is still to this day acknowledged worldwide. One of my favourite examples of this is the car model of Subaru. Now, Subaru is actually the Japanese name for Pallades, and the symbol of Subaru is that of the Pallades cluster. Uh, and this is in reference to an oral tradition of the Pallades cl cluster dating back to the 8th century. Now, the Pallades object is what we call an open star cluster. This essentially means that there's a bunch of stars in a small area. Uh, and it's quite easy to be able to find this star cluster with just the naked eye. So one way you can try and locate the, the Pallades is by first identifying the constellation of Orion. Once you're able to find Orion, it's quite easy to see because there are three stars in a very um, like linear um, fashion, a line, uh, and they're quite bright stars as well. And you can basically follow a line from Orion's belt 
through the bright red star of Aldebaran, um, which is of course a variable star as we learned through the Kakatha story, and then following it across to the Pallades uh, open cluster. Now, the Pallades are often used as a seasonal marker in the Southern Hemisphere and in a lot of Indigenous um, oral traditions. And this is largely because of their, their timing in the night sky. So the Pallades will rise in the east uh, during around October, November, so, you know, around uh, when it's starting to get warmer. And then as the months get cooler, uh, it actually sets in the western part of the sky during winter months. Now the next object we'll look at are the planets. Um, now these objects are quite easy to identify in the sky once you know what you're looking for. Um, but not all the planets in, this, in our solar system are visible to the naked eye. Um, only Venus, Jupiter, Saturn, Mars uh, easily visible and if you're really good and really know what you're looking at you can also see Mercury uh, but it's really hard to see due to its close proximity to the Sun so you've really got to get it right at sunrise or right at sunset. Uh, the planets move across the sky over a specific path um, this is the path that we refer to as the ecliptic. <clears throat> now the ecliptic comes from this disk orientation of our solar system that we've got here um, and where the ecliptic plane is, is this disk of the solar system. So this is the um, planet, the path that the planets orbit around the sun in. And from the surface of the Earth, it's the path from east to west, the same as the path that the sun follows each day from sunrise to sunset. So using this knowledge, when we're trying to identify the planets, we can ask ourselves if the object that we're looking at is in the ecliptic plane. If the object is not in the ecliptic plane, then it obviously can't be one of the planets. Mm. So not every bright object that appears in the ecliptic is obviously going to be a planet. There are other objects in the ecliptic as well. So how do we tell the difference between, say, a planet from a star? Well, for Venus and Jupiter, it's pretty easy. These are some of the brightest objects in the night sky, of course, not including the moon. And so if they are in the ecliptic and they appear very bright, it's very likely that you are either looking at uh, Venus or Jupiter. Now, for other planets, it gets a little bit harder, but we can use the fact that planets are much closer to us than the background stars. So for a planet like Saturn, it will look a little bit more like a disk than a star, which will usually look like a bright point source, just a little small point. Um, whereas Saturn, it will have kind of more that disk shape and also it will not twinkle like stars twinkle. Now, the planets are also a great point to introduce the idea of possibly looking at some equipment or some instruments uh, that you could use in order to aid your observations. Yeah, so if you did decide to go out and get yourself a telescope, the planets, particularly the two big, biggest ones, Jupiter and Saturn, are amongst the most interesting objects to initially begin pointing a telescope at. Saturn, which, as you said, looks like a a bit of a disk to the naked eye will now show details of the ring system that surrounds it and a telescope with a high enough resolution will even be able to re reveal the Cassini divide that is the the large gap in the ring system around Saturn as well. Zooming in on Jupiter will re reveal a few interesting um, details as well. Uh, closer observations of Jupiter itself will show the different colored bands of Jupiter um, and if it's pointed towards us, even the big red spot, uh, which is a large storm that's actually happening on the surface of Jupiter and has been happening for um, decades now. Uh, additionally, a telescope will allow you to be able to see the Galilean moons. Uh, those are the four main moons of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And if you took on a project, you could observe these moons each night and have a little drawing about where their positions are, and over a period of a few weeks, you could even calculate the orbital period of those Galilean moons of Jupiter with your own telescope. That's very cool. 
Now, the next object we're going to look at is uh, by no means difficult to identify. Uh, it is the moon. Uh, and the moon is obviously the brightest object in the night sky. So if you do take that extra step and do obtain uh, a telescope or even a set of binoculars, the moon is actually really interesting to look at uh, and can reveal some pretty fascinating features uh, if you do have these instruments. So it may be tempting to look at the moon during its full phase when uh, we see it in its brightest state where it's being fully illuminated. Uh, but it's not necessarily the best time to be looking at the moon, particularly with these instruments. So instead, one of the best times to be looking at the moon through a telescope or through binoculars would actually be around the first or third quarter. This is because the most detail can be seen during these phases. And particularly when observing that line on the moon uh, where the dark and the light meet. Now along this line, you'll actually be able to see the surface craters and the features in really great detail due to the contrast of the light and the dark. And so, at this point, you've invested in a telescope and you've maybe started with the basics of observing the planets and the moon and these easy to identify objects. And now you might want to go out and try and find some stuff that you can't really see with the naked eye. Um, so these objects are what we call deep sky objects. So um, These are much, much further away than the stuff we've looked at so far. And once again, we're going to head back to the constellation Orion in this case. And now we're going to point our telescopes just above that belt of Orion um, to find the Orion Nebula. Now on a clear night in an area with very little light pollution, mm. Orion's Nebula is actually visible to the naked eye. Um, but you really need to be knowing what you're looking at and what you're looking for in doing that. Um, and based on this picture here, we can see zooming in on the Orion Nebula with our telescopes, we can reveal some wonderful details. A nebulous region, which is a region of gas and dust that we see here. And most of these nebulas are uh, what we call an early stage of star formation. So this is where those regions where new stars are formed. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, another object that is really awesome to see as well is an object near the Southern Cross or also known as uh, the Crux. So here, if we look towards the star uh, Mimosa, the second brightest star in the Southern Cross, just to the southeast of this star, we see what we call the Jewel Box Cluster. Now, again, this is an open cluster um, of stars and it is named the Jewel Box because when early observers were first able to observe this object, they commented that the combination of all the different colored stars actually resembled that of some fine jewelry and a jewelry box. So this list of objects that we've gone over here today is by no means an exhaustive list of objects in the night sky. If we were to try and do that, we would be here forever. There is so much to go out there and look at and observe. But hopefully this provides you with a nice starting point should you wish to go out and explore the night sky for yourself. Now in the following sections, we will also look at some of the different types of telescopes um, that you can use, uh, including some that you can um, pick up yourselves and, and go and observe some of those objects that we've spoken about here today.